One of the pervasive questions that uh, embroil historians of women is the question about where we find women in the archives, because often we look in places that we don't find them and we find them in unexpected places. Uh, we're talking to Ty Jones, who is the curator of the Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Columbia University. He's curator of American history. And uh, I'm curious, Ty, where do we find women in the archives? Well, it's a great question and a question that scholars have been struggling with for uh, several generations now. Uh, beginning really in the 1960s, I think, with the rise of the new social history, what was called the new social history. Uh, and it was women in the archives, it was people of color, uh, working class people, uh, everyday people uh, in general, um, historians who were interested in telling a type of history that would come from below and was not focused only on political and artistic leaders, uh, went to the archives and uh, really had to discover a new way of using these materials. Uh, most archives uh, had been created to celebrate the work of great uh, men and a few um, really uh, phenomenal and extraordinary uh, women. Um, and so people who wanted to look beyond uh, those people really had to create a set of uh, methods and strategies for finding uh, people's voices. And so here at Columbia, for instance, we discovered that the year 1960, right when this social history uh, was really gaining momentum, was the first year that people, uh, researchers called uh, documents like this. This is a government record book from the 1740s uh, in greater numbers than printed books. So if you were looking at books, you were looking at the things that were written and created by people with a certain social standing that allowed them to be creators of books. If you wanted to see everyone else, you had to look elsewhere. And one of the main places people looked was uh, government sources. Uh, these are women who came in contact with uh, the state, with the court system, with medical care. Uh, and their stories, it turned out, were embedded in these types of sources and documents. Mm. So let me just get this straight before we look at the document. You're saying government sources, but I'm thinking uh, wills, for example, mm -hmm. and testaments, which were sometimes uh, written by notaries, but where you could find, for example, what kinds of household goods were owned by a particular household, mm -hmm. even though the kinds of goods were very modest. Mm -hmm. uh, you could find those there. Mm -hmm. Would you count that as a government document or would you? Perhaps not, but you know, official documents, uh, legal documents perhaps, yeah, definitely legal documents. Yes. And we have here uh, wills and inventories of people after their deaths and those are the types of sources that uh, historians of women really came to favor in that time. Right, and those documents tended to be overlooked by researchers who were interested in what men were doing. Yeah, or they would be used to do the genealogy of families, the genealogy of prominent men's lineages, but they could be reimagined by historians interested in other questions. Right. So the numbers of pots and pans, for example, owned mm. by a particular household That's might right. tell you about the prosperity of that household, but it would also tell you about the well-being of the widow or the daughter yeah, who that's followed. Right. Looms yeah, and spindles and beds and household implements, absolutely. So those documents were rich in sources and data that people had never really uh, known to notice before that time. Right. And um, I mean, you were, um, of the generation that was prominent in creating the new social history. So I wonder if you remember uh, coming across any of those particular types of documents that you found especially I, uh, useful for that type of I reading. I do in the colonial period, although I didn't particularly look at wills and so on, I did look at indenture contracts written by, uh, generally written by men for women who were indentured servants and which revealed what an indentured servant might get at the end of five years or seven years of uh, her service. Mm -hmm. 
and it was often no more than a suit of clothes or a suit of clothes and a bale of cotton or a bag of rice or something like that. And, uh, and on that, she was expected to go and start her life. Um, sometimes the indentured contract would include punishments or court records would tell us, you know, if an indentured servant, indentured for seven years, had a child uh, in or out of wedlock. If the child was out of wedlock, the child was often removed to a poorhouse mm -hmm. or a wet nurse. Uh, but the mother of that child was charged an extra two years of service. So one does from those documents get a sense, dry as they seem, of the conditions under which women lived. And did you have a sense of it being a radical act or even a subversive act for you to be in the archives reading those documents in that way? What was the spirit of the times, if you can recall? Well, the spirit of the times was often uh, astonishment that we could find the documents at all because they weren't organized uh, by sex or gender. So that to find, uh, you know, perhaps two or three documents that pertain to women, one often had to go through reams and reams of documents which didn't pertain to women at all. So you had to be very patient. But then, if you were patient, the smoking gun turned up, and that was very rewarding. And the same, of course, is true for court documents in general. So, you know, women who are brought to trial for giving birth to a so-called bastard uh, child and the rights of that child have to be determined without knowledge of the father, with knowledge of the father, when the father was marriageable, if the father refused or could not for some reason marry, all those questions emerge. But again, it's a question of really looking carefully. Nowadays, I think that's somewhat easier because uh, archivists are much more conscious of sex just as they are of race and it's possible often to find indexes or finding documents that reveal the sex of the person. That's true, although in the context of this online course, it's probably worth remembering that uh, for historians, the real labor of history uh, still requires those countless hours working through papers in boxes in libraries that will likely never be digitized. I think people have an assumption that everything you need to know has been digitized now, but even uh, half a century on from the birth of this uh, new historical movement, uh, you, there are historians still hoping for that smoking gun, uh, and patience still uh, pays off for people who are doing research at any level.